Hello and welcome to our channel. I am Team Kangaroo Director James Dunbar and we have something a bit different for you today. There were a lot of questions about our most recent film on glomerata wasps regarding how the wasps are able to manipulate their host behavior and that sort of thing. So we wanted to make a film talking about the science behind what was going on. Now I personally am not really qualified to answer any of these questions, so today we have a special guest, Principal Curator of Insects at the Natural History Museum in London and wasp expert Dr. Gavin Broad. Hello Gavin, thank you very much for helping us out with this today. Hi James, thank you very much for inviting me. So I suppose, I mean, if I wanted to give a very short answer, it would probably be, I don't know. Uh, in fact, a slightly longer answer is nobody knows, but um, we do know aspects of this. Uh, we do know aspects of what's going on when the, this wasp is, um, obviously this brood of wasps eating the caterpillar and then emerging. And as so beautifully shown in your film, there's various ways in which the caterpillar is not behaving like a normal unparasitized caterpillar. So I guess there's a few clues as to what's going on. Um, I guess if we start at the beginning, you know, you've got the wasp, the adult wasp coming along and laying uh, eggs, also with venom and viruses. So you've got a whole complex thing going on right from the beginning there. And then when the wasp larvae are quite big and they're emerging from the host, they're also releasing some kind of compounds as well, which are interfering with the host. So you've got this poor little caterpillar is, is being sort of uh, manipulated by the wasps at various stages through its, uh, through its life and also throughout its body. It's, it's, it's quite a complicated thing. When the actual wasps um, are emerging, obviously one of the weird things about um, the caterpillar, these, these wasps pop out and the caterpillar, as you, as you can see in the film, it, it just, it's, it's quiet at that point. It's not really doing anything. Um, and one of the really cool things is that these wasp larvae are releasing uh, some chemicals that actually interfere with the, the caterpillar's nervous system and anaesthetize it to some degree. So the idea is that, so the caterpillar's activity slows down, its, it's metabolic rate slows down, it doesn't want to be uh, eating or moving at that point. And this anaesthetic property is, is affecting its, its cuticle, its skin. So the idea is that the caterpillar then doesn't notice these things wriggling out and doesn't try to bite them. Because again, I mean, beautiful footage in your film of the, the adult uh, wasp being attacked by this caterpillar quite vigorously. You know, these things are not defenseless. Yeah. So the wasp larvae increase their chances of survival by uh, making sure the caterpillar doesn't really feel them. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully there's some groups out there actually answering these questions now. Um, I mean, we do know that, so the caterpillar obviously is, um, it's, its uh, behavior is altered so that it will then lay down some extra silk over the, um, the wasp cocoons and it will guard them. It doesn't want to feed anymore. Um, so some of these behaviors are exactly what you would see when a, a caterpillar is going to pupate. So, you know, they lay down silk strands and then spin their chrysalis and it's, it's sort of stuck down to the, to the leaf or whatever it is they're, they're pupating. Uh, and of course, they don't feed much at the right at the end of their, of their uh, caterpillar stage. So perhaps it's it's that the uh, the wasps are inducing these sort of behaviours that would normally occur a bit later on. Uh, we know that happens in some parasitoid wasps that attack spiders. They basically uh, they modify the, the spider web um, that it spins, and it's doing that through uh, so basically interfering with juvenile hormone, which is a hormone that gets up released in large quantities when the spider is about to molt. So then the spider lays some extra silk. It's not as simple as that uh, because it keeps doing the behavior over and over again until you get a really weird web. Yeah, so the wasps actually have um, this amazing, so there's several groups of wasps uh, that have these amazing relationships with viruses. They've been sort of co-opted into the wasp um, defense system. So they have a region of their, of their glands, um, it's called the calyx gland. And this is where these, wasp, these virus particles reproduce and they sort of get injected along with the, the venom and the eggs. And these then obviously reproduce inside the caterpillar. And 
uh, basically help to knock out the caterpillar immune system, or at least reduce it, reduce the number of sort of hemocytes, uh, which can go along and, and um, destroy foreign objects. So it's incredible. Um, yeah, they got quite an incredible sort of attack system. And it, the weird thing about these viruses is they've been captured by wasps or co-opted by wasps at least three different times in evolution. Uh, so three possibly different families of viruses have ended up doing much the same roles in different wasps. One of the, some, um, some groups of wasps, we have no idea yet whether they even have viruses or not. They could be, uh, and some have virus-like particles, which are really reduced sort of things. Um, it's quite an intriguing system going on. Um, yeah, quite possibly. Uh, I suppose there's lots of different examples of genomes incorporating viral DNA. So these are sort of, uh, you know, including our own genomes, have got traces of uh, viruses that have been captured over the millions of years, and in some cases have, have ended up inferring some kind of use to us uh, in coding particular genes. So yeah, these things probably do start from infections and actually prove to be quite useful. Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, so I suppose the thing about um, these caterpillar, uh, these, these wasp larvae is they are only really able to eat particular tissue types. So um, their first instars, the first sort of growth stage of the larvae have fairly big mandibles. And it may be that that's involved in fighting if, if there's already a brood of wasps in there. And then later when they're emerging, they have bigger mandibles again. But in the meantime, they've got very small mandibles. They're not really capable of sort of eating tough stuff. So they're just, they're only really imbibing sort of this semi-liquid hemolymph and uh, sort of fat. So, and presumably, you know, the organs inside have tough membranes and things which they just would avoid. Uh, um, so what they introduce some, I think they introduce some kind of um, proteinases as well, which presumably makes the cuticle a bit softer where they're chewing through and they, and they molt at the same time. So they go through their last molt as they're emerging. So that exuvia, you know, the sort of molted skin slightly half sort of plugs the gap that they're leaving. Uh, Cartesia really take it to a sort of quite higher level. These are sort of really um, incredible parasitoids because they're dealing with caterpillars that are out in the open. So all their behavior has to be around protecting themselves from being eaten at some point. Um, so this sort of host manipulation, this making sure that they're not exposed at times, you know. It's, so even as they're popping out of the host, they're already spinning silk. So I think the, um, it just increases the chance that it will be, the wasps will be eaten or parasitized themselves. Um, there's actually, so there's a bunch of different things that can uh, parasitize the cocoons of the, of the Cartesia. So there's um, a little, little ichneumonid called Lysibia, which, um, you know, very nice little thing, slightly longer of repositor. So, and then you've got the little calcids that bumble along and will also um, attack them. Things like uh, Dibrachis and I think a couple of other genera. So they're vulnerable. And um, one thing is, so the, yeah, the caterpillar probably reduces the attack, uh, the chances of those other little wasps getting them at least in a certain time period before the caterpillar dies. Uh, and of course the silk it lays down is the same effect. It's adding a bit more depth to that cocoon cluster, so it's making them less acceptable, less accessible to wasps. I mean, maybe the ones the ones in the outer surface are still more likely to get parasitized, but at least the ones a little bit further down the clump will be will be hopefully safe. Um, I don't know to what extent they, the caterpillars discourage birds, but I've certainly seen broods of these Cartesia cocoons all pecked open, I think by long-tailed tits. Just as far as we know, I mean, generally they die in about, about three days or something like that. Certainly three days later, these, um, it's, um, there's still these really high levels of um, various sort of peptides in, that have been basically this sort of molecular signature of the wasps. So they've they, they cause all these sort of chemicals to be released that basically slow it down and stop it wanting to feed. And those chemicals are still being released up, you know, certainly three days later. So the immune, so the attack, it's just called a cytokine storm, it's released by the, the wasp larvae. This is long lasting effect on the nervous system of the caterpillar. So it probably, even though it could never pupate because it's, it's lost so much energy and it's probably gonna get invaded by viruses and bacteria because it's got holes in it. And 
even then it still wouldn't feed probably because of the uh, chemical attack by the wasps. So it, 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 it's as good as dead. It would not go back to being a normal caterpillar. It's more or less using the last of its calories Absolutely. to just yeah. defend the wasp. Um, cool. Well, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, it's very fascinating. I do have to say I really do love wasps. Uh, they really, really are the most interesting animals on the planet. Thank, thank you, thank you very much again uh, for taking the time to do this, uh, Gavin. We do really appreciate it. And thank you very much for watching. If you like this, do please consider subscribing. Rest assured that we are working on some more of our sort of more like classical natural history content, so look out for that. Um, and yeah, hope you have a great day.